and I'll be moderating, moderating this forum as the director of Multicultural Ministries, and we're hosting this conference. But we want to welcome right now to join us at the table our bishop, Brother David Bernard, if he would come. We'd like to welcome the director of North American Missions, Brother Scott Sistrunk, and our Building the Bridge Ministry Director, Brother Michael Mitchell. And for Spanish Evangelism, our Director is Brother Raul Orozco. I just have a seat here around the table. I will make mention as a reminder that uh, this forum that we're entering into now is being live streamed from the Dallas First Church media website. And this is also uh, on the Multicultural Ministries UPCI Facebook page live right now. So in our audience, we have roughly 100 people. We have uh, about 100 more split up between two other events now during our summit. And uh, no doubt we have many that are watching online and Facebook Live, and we expect this to be archived. So the numbers will no doubt reach the thousands that will get an opportunity to hear this. I want to say at the onset, I, I stand to be corrected, but I believe this is a pretty historic gathering right now. We have the Bishop, uh, General Superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church, and we have the three divisions of the United Pentecostal Church or ministries uh, whose primary focus is evangelizing North America. Now, we give honor to all the ministries of the United Pentecostal Church. They all have special focuses, and we support and believe in them. But this group right here, uh, these gentlemen and myself, our focus, everything we do in our ministries is about evangelizing the people groups of North America. Would you give our panel a big round of applause before we begin? <laughs> Amen. The first question we have today we want to direct to Bishop Bernard. And this question is simply this. Brother Bernard, can you give us a quick synopsis of how the ministries that are represented here today, multicultural ministries, North American ministries, building the bridge, and Spanish evangelism, a quick idea on how they are positioned in their separate focuses and how they can work together. In other words, how do we function separately and how can we complement each other in unity? And I, I digress. We have microphones for everybody just behind you here. Sorry. All right. Let me answer this question directly. First of all, we have North American Missions. Brother Scott Sistrunk is the director. The focus of North American Missions is evangelizing the U.S. and Canada, particularly planting new uh, preaching points, daughter works, and home missions churches or North American missions churches. That's its main focus, how to start new works. And that involves, of course, training the church planters and helping those new churches to grow. So it, it bleeds into also discipleship and church growth because you can't really plant without growing. So, But they're, they're looking primarily at the initial stages of how we can get more churches and, of course, they're also focused on metro evangelism, particularly those major population centers where we're underrepresented. How can we plant more churches in those areas specifically? They also oversee any unorganized area or, I should say, an area where there are fewer churches, specifically Quebec. Uh, they still oversee Quebec, although now Quebec has a great uh, leadership presence and will eventually become a district like the others. So that's North American missions. Then we have Multicultural Ministries, which is the organizer of this summit. Brother Brock Chavis is the chair. It focuses on various ethnic and language-based ministries here in North America. In other words, how do we reach people who, have, who speak different languages or who have a unique identity that is not being reached well through other means. So most of it, as I said, is language-based, like Chinese, Korean, Burmese, so on. There are several that are targeting unique groups, such as the Amish Mennonite has a unique culture. The, the Jewish culture is unique. 
United Nations ministry as a unique opportunity. So all of those specialized, targeted ministries uh, to various ethnicities and language groups within the U.S. and Canada come under multicultural ministries. Now, there are two exceptions, two big exceptions. Spanish evangelism ministries, Brother Raul Orozco, since Spanish is unique in North America in, in size and recent immigrants, you have more Spanish speakers by far than any other language other than English, so it needs its own structure. Uh, and so Spanish evangelism ministries is a way for the Spanish-speaking ministers to reach into the Spanish-speaking community of North America. And then building the bridge is also unique because it is focused historically on African Americans and blacks. And why is that important? Well, because of the unique history of the United States. Uh, this has been a situation where for years, blacks have been underrepresented in the UPCI. And so we realize a need to, to, to increase our focus on evangeliz evangelization into the black community and highlighting the participation of African Americans and blacks in the UPCI. We changed the name to Building the Bridge some years ago to reflect that we're not simply a Caucasian church trying to reach into the black community, but we are a multiracial church. We're a black church. We're a white church. We're a Hispanic church. We're all of the above, but we still want to have an emphasis on the participation of African Americans given their unique status in our culture and our history. And they're still underrepresented in the church, so we must be more effective in methods that reach the African Americans. But we call it building the bridge because a bridge goes both ways. We now recognize there are many pioneers and leaders of the black community within the UPCI who have made major contributions to our entire fellowship. And so we want to leverage, and Brother Mike Mitchell is the chair. He pastors a large church in New York City which is very engaged in the community. And historically, African-American, black, Caribbean churches have been more engaged in the community than your typical church. And so they have something to teach all of us. How can we reach urban areas more effectively? How can we reach all cultures more effectively? How can we be more effective in, in our civic affairs and social affairs? And so that's why we call it building the bridge. So while the emphasis remains of uh, the importance of participation of African Americans and blacks, the focus of the ministry is how can we leverage that experience to bless everyone. So really there's an overlap. Uh, we don't have, we each have a distinct mission, but it's not a segregated mission. And that's why everybody's here together because we're all trying to reach souls. And there might be uh, uh, an African-American pastor who reaches in the Spanish community. So we want uh, all of us, and then they're going to plant a new church. <laughs> and so all of us need to be engaged in working together to evangelize North America. Thank you for that great answer. I've been asked to mention for those watching on Facebook Live, you can submit questions, and those questions will be submitted to us here on the panel. I mentioned this yesterday in our banquet, and before I go to the next question, we want to say that this meeting we're having here at, at this time, it's a multicultural summit. So during this meeting, we've been talking a lot about the focus on other cultures, uh, cultures that originated outside the United States and Canada, ethnic groups and nationalities, minorities, but we do want to say that nothing that we have done or said in this, in this meeting is meant to overlook or underemphasize or take value away from the fact that all of us believe that every culture matters, including Caucasian, North Americans, and Canadians. Amen. And uh, what we're doing is we have a special focus here, but the name of this is Multicultural ministry, and that means everybody. One of our big visions and a lot of what our ministry directors for MCM are promoting in their meetings now is let's also be multicultural. We're focusing on the group that we're called to minister to, 
but let's teach and train. Let's have multicultural services ourselves. So we're seeing some great advancements there. The next question I have is going to go to Brother Scott Sistrant uh, with North American Missions. And the question is this. Brother Sistrant, what is the message of North American Missions to its upcoming church planters in view of an increasingly multicultural North America? Well, simply put, if you're not going to reach all cultures, then you're not fulfilling the mission of the church. And so church planners have a unique um, opportunity in that we're not trying to turn a church that may have been monocultural for years and change the hearts and attitudes of people. We get a fresh slate, a blank slate. And so uh, I think the emphasis on multicultural evangelism and knowing that we're all made of one blood and we're all equally valued comes from the heart, right? And so church planners should have a heart for multicultural evangelism. And so uh, when you do that and you start from that, it, it's almost impossible not to have a multicultural church. When you throw that net out there, all manner of fishes uh, come in. But also say that in the United States in this time period, um, immigration, legal and illegal, has increased, and we are probably more racially diverse in America than ever before. And so if you're not going to fo focus on mul uh, multicultural uh, outreach, then you're going to have a hard time planting a church. <laughs> okay, so if you just, uh, and that goes for Spanish or black or white or what, anytime you just focus on one culture that's not language-based, you're going to have a hard time. So uh, in addition to that, um, the metro cities of North America, major metropolitan areas, remain the most under-evangelized areas in North America. Well, they're also the most diverse. <clears throat> and so we intend to focus in North American mission on planting churches in these major metropolitan areas. And so uh, necessarily we've got to become uh, more skilled and we welcome what multicultural ministry is doing, what building the bridge, what Spanish is doing in increasing our expertise at reaching other cultures because uh, that's where we're going. And these immigrants are, normally don't move to small towns where uh, the, even the local residents have a hard time getting jobs. They move to major cities. And so we plan to, to reach those. And so our message to every church planter is you need, if you're not already educated in multicultural evangelism, uh, before you plant a church, make sure that you learn all you can about this. Very good. As a follow-up question, out of the ministries gathered here, North American Missions is the largest department, has a very uh, strong uh, fundraising uh, program each year through Christmas for Christ, and church planting is its major focus. There are many resources within North American Missions for church planters. My question is, how can pastors from multicultural ministry daughter works or Spanish churches or those connected with building the bridge, how can they better connect to North American missions and take advantage of those resources that you have created and designed? Well, when we all get to heaven, we're all going to be one culture, right? And so in the church, we should be. Uh, it's, it's God's culture, not uh, the different cultures is not a result of what God did, it's a result of what man did. And so uh, the, the church uh, should be uh, unified. And the beautiful thing, whether no matter what community you're reaching with evangelism, Bible culture is you gather those people into churches. Okay, you can't be equipped. You, uh, and, and I, uh, I don't want to have time to explain this, but you can't be saved without the church. That's my strong belief. You have to have a local church uh, to be discipled. And so whatever our outreaches are, it, it ultimately winds up in church planting. Okay, and so whether you're Spanish evangelism, uh, whatever ethnic uh, 
or cultural outreach you have, there has to be a church. Well, that's where North American Missions comes in. And we support Spanish churches, Burmese churches. We are really... Let me jump in here. So what, just to make sure people out there understand, so whatever church you're planting in whatever ethnicity or language, you could take advantage of a Christmas for Christ yes. grant to support the pastor. Yes. You could take advantage of church in the day building program. So any tool that North American Missions has is available for every church planter of every race and every ethnicity. Absolutely. And so these uh, multicultural ministries, the other ministries, they don't have to raise their own church planning funds or their own support funds. That's North American Missions. And so we distribute that money uh, to all uh, churches. And so... Uh, uh, and in the UPCI, our growth is mainly multicultural growth. If, if we didn't have growth in Spanish and other ethnic cultures, our growth would be probably 60% less than it is. And so we welcome all of this, and we uh, intend to back it, raise the funds, and fund it. Our next two questions, uh, I'm going to uh, get Brother Orozco and Brother Mitchell into this. I'll ask the same question of each, starting with Brother Mitchell. What are the major focuses of building the bridge ministry, and what ways can non-black or non-African American pastors find building the bridge as a resource for their local church? Well, the major focus of building the bridge is to reach into the African American community. At the inception of this ministry 40 years ago, its primary focus was to reach into the black community. However, the black community has been transformed by migration. People of every ethnicity has now moved into the inner city. Thus, the African American is not exclusively uh, within these areas. Therefore, building the bridge had to rebrand or refocus its uh, mindset that now we had to create resources that would reach to every culture group regardless of ethnicity. Um, how a pastor can reach into the inner city is by taking advantage of the resources that we have developed such as Appreciation Sunday. Appreciation Sunday reaches everyone no matter what their culture group is, and it extends to a particular profession, whether it be law enforcement, educator, um, or any of those areas, and a pastor can now launch that ministry into the community and reach everyone coming into his church. Excellent, excellent. Brother Roscoe, I, I wanna ask you a very similar question. What are the major focuses of UPCI Spanish evangelism, and in what specific ways can a non-Hispanic or non-Latino pastor find Spanish evangelism as a resource? Well, um, first of all, we have uh, the language. I, I would uh, summarize this in three things. Language, the fellowship and representation. Um, as uh, you know, Spanish ministers, the language is one of the things that we deal. It's not always the language, sometimes it has to do with culture. But as Spanish ministers, we provide a um, fellowship. Those that want to start a Spanish, ministry, a Spanish church, for instance, we provide them with, uh, there's plenty of materials now trans being trans translated throughout the years. And uh, so there's plenty of material that has been done throughout the years. So this is materials that they can use. There's also you know, providing them with, uh, with fellowship. Uh, uh, we have our national uh, or our yearly conference where everybody can come and, you know, get motivated, get, uh, you know, ignited to do more for God. And, uh, and then we have a representation. I have the privilege of uh, sitting in the general board and, uh, and then bringing, you know, to the general board issues that we face. Like we recently uh, now pastors that are, you know, in the process of fixing their immigration status, they can get licensed now, and, and a few other issues that are, you know, that are um, 
specific to the Spanish, uh, uh, to the Spanish language and the Spanish culture. So those, those three things I would say are the main, main uh, things that we're focusing on. And um, there's, there's plenty of you. Half an hour I could uh, talk a little more. <laughs> but, <laughs> Brother Chavis, I want to interject too for people who are not aware, but all of these gentlemen are sitting on our general board. And that way, in every general board meeting, we know that the perspectives will be represented. Now, of course, North American Missions, by definition, is a member of the general and executive board. But Multicultural Ministries Director, and uh, Brother Chavis looks about as white as I am, but he's half Native American. So it's interesting to have a Native American representation, as well as black and Hispanic, always sitting in our general board meetings so that if we discuss some issue that deals with culture or ethnicity that maybe some people haven't had experience, we at least know there are three guys here that definitely have a multicultural experience and a different racial or ethnic or language background that that perspective will always be part of the conversation. If we're getting ready to make a major decision that has a major impact, uh, somebody's going to say, wait just a minute, have you considered such and such? And I think that's a strength. It's not a matter of political correctness. It's a matter of the importance. If you go to our website, if you go to the Pentecostal Life magazine, if you go to our uh, UPCI director or manual, you will see all of these leaders listed at the top of the leadership of the United Pentecostal Church International. Very good, very good. Brother Mitchell, I want to ask a question of you. And then uh, I would like for any other members of the panel who'd like to comment on this to, to chime in just after. What are some ways that local churches may unintentionally fail to signal a clear welcome to minorities when they visit their churches? There, there are many signals that can be given by a church, but from my perspective, if you do not diversify your song selections, which is a very big issue because singing is a major part of our worship experience. Uh, I am from Jamaica, and it's easy for me or my congregation, if they're not educated, to just begin to sing the songs that Caribbean people enjoy. But because we are intentional in diversifying our church, then we are very careful in our song selections to ensure that everyone that comes for a true worship experience is included even from the standpoint of singing. So I think that we have to be very careful. Um, one of the other things Bishop talked about, potluck, and you know, diversifying even your meal selection when you're having a special event. I, you know, we just can't continue to just serve what Caribbean people enjoy, we have to make sure that we include everyone and every meal selection in what our congregation is reflecting. Very good. I'd like to add to that, song selection is very important in, in worship. And uh, I'd like to add, if you're, if you're a pastor and you, you're analyzing the demographics of your congregation, uh, begin to bring in special speakers on occasion that reflect your congregation. It's, it's easy to, without even realizing it, just pick your favorite preachers. And sometimes your, your favorite preachers, you may not be viewing them, even considering what ethnicity they might be. And over the course of a year, you've brought in four or five evangelists from a specific cultural group, not even realizing that these are just your favorite preachers that you feel connect with your church. But when you bring in a speaker that is of the same culture of someone in your congregation, it gives them an opportunity to see a path for themselves to be involved in ministry, to be involved in leadership, and to celebrate. They can relate and celebrate someone of their own uh, diverse group in leadership. And I think it's very important. We're not talking about just tokenism or promoting a racial identity, but let's look at this way. Thinking outside the box. As you mentioned, we naturally gravitate towards our friends, people we know, people we're comfortable with, and chances are that's going to be people of our same ethnic background. So I'm not saying to pick someone because of their race. I'm saying 
broaden your selection to include a pool of equally qualified people, but just be more intentional and sensitive. And I do think that's a great thought, your guest speakers, and, but also pathway to participation at all levels of the local church, including leadership, being intentional in the things you say. For instance, it could be a simple thing, but you're using an illustration in preaching a message. Uh, maybe use a quotation from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Or maybe if there's a certain celebration, you make sure to make reference not only to what you were raised with, but something that might connect with a different ethnicity. Just diversify your frame of reference of the illustrations you use, the examples you use, the missionaries that you use. Just, just be more intentional and more inclusive not to, as I said, not to be politically correct, but to reflect the existing diversity of our society as well as either the existing or hoped for diversity of, that already is in the local church. And I believe, Bishop, also in your selection as it relates to speakers, one of the mistakes that sometimes our friends make um, based on that they're coming to what they call a black church, they, they feel they have to make the statement that, man, some of my best friends are black. You know, I just love West Indian foods. Is there anybody out there? And they'll name one of the West Indian meals that, and they think that's a way of connecting, not knowing that intentionally they've just disconnected themselves from the church. So that also has to be something that our friends are educated on, that when they come, they know right. what verbiage to use and sure. what not to use. And I like to say that in, a, in another way. We don't have to constantly feel the need to qualify ourselves. If this is who you really are and you're constantly qualifying yourself, you're signaling, this is not who I really am and I want you to get a different idea. If it's who you really are, you don't have to say, this is my black friend. This is my Spanish friend. You know what? This is my friend. People can see that they're black or Spanish. It's obvious. Don't have to qualify yourself. And I think that speaks louder and more than you saying those words that do qualify. Brother Bernard said the word tokenism. And that, that's a, now we get into some deeper water here. And we talk about leadership. I, I just want to throw this out, and I actually wrote about this in an article that was published early this year in the Pentecostal Life. Tokenism and what we use as a term affirmative action, in my opinion, I don't believe it has a place in ministry. What I believe we should be thinking about is intentional mentorship because I feel it's very damaging to place someone in a leadership role for them to later find out the only reason they're there is because they look a certain way. People are not stupid. Your congregation can do the math. Guests can figure it out. If you just have someone sitting on the platform but they have no role, they have no authority, they're not in any way of leadership, that doesn't answer the question. That doesn't automatically make you seeker friendly to multicultural groups, no. But here's what does. Intentionally focusing and saying, in my community we have a great number of a specific culture. Lord, help me to find someone that I can invest in, that I can build, that I can, I can encourage, that I can teach, train, and promote. And then as they naturally grow, they are qualified to naturally fill those roles. And then we don't have to qualify ourselves by saying, we have someone of color on the platform. Everyone knows they have a great ministry. They have confidence in them, and it speaks volumes to the community. Amen. In a church planning context, sometimes, you know, when you got 20 people, you, you can be um, monoculture and not mean to be. Sure. And so uh, what I found helpful is when I have somebody in, in a monocultural environment, you have somebody come in that, that is not of that culture, the, the way I try to disarm that is through personal relationship, okay? I, I make sure I'm very intentional about trying to make them comfortable. Uh, 
in a church of 200, maybe they can't talk directly to the pastor, but I can invite them for coffee that afternoon, okay? And I can signal my willingness, and then as a relationship grows, I can have an open conversation with them about, I understand that we're not diverse here, but I intend to be. We intend. The future of our church is diverse. Help us make it diverse. And so be intentional about it. So we, we've covered song selection, speaker selections, intentional mentorship for leadership, genuine relationships, and a question or a comment just came from the crowd. Consider baptizing people in their first language. Isn't that beautiful? That, that's just something great. Consider baptizing them in their first language. It, that, I think that's very special. Thank you for that. Brother Roscoe, here, here's a kind of a, a, a technical question, but I think it's very, very valuable that's come in. Some churches favor verbal translation in Spanish using a translator, someone who is on the platform and, and actually verbally saying it through a microphone. Uh, and other churches use the headphones or earpieces or some other type of device where someone maybe in the back or off to the side is speaking in their ear. What method do you feel is best and or what would you recommend for a church that is primarily English speaking but has a desire to cross over that language barrier? Very good question. I have seen both uh, used. Uh, we have used uh, uh, also both of those. Uh, and the the one you know where where the person is translating some somewhere in the building, and they have to be translating simultaneously. So they, uh, unless that person is super good translator, it's gonna lose half of the message. Okay. Plus, with that way, um, during the songs, during the other stuff that is said, usually a lot of a lot of it is lost. I, I would recommend that as. A, just a, this is the beginning, as the beginning of, uh, of uh, you know, if you have two or three people, that is fine. Uh, but if, um, if, you know, if you have a few people already and, and the intention is to, to ultimately, ultimately uh, grow that particular ministry, I would recommend side-by-side -side, uh, translation or interpretation. Because uh, this way, everything that has been said, everything, uh, the, uh, the person that is speaking the first language gives time to the other person that is translating, and then everybody gets the same thing. And uh, when in a setting like that, uh, you need to consider also uh, the music. The music needs to be also you know, bilingual. You know, there has to be some music that is in, you know, whatever the language, and then and then do some others, not only the music, but also the, sometimes the style of music uh, is important because, uh, you know, it's not, it's not only the words, but it's also the, the culture of the people and different things. So, but that, uh, we ultimately came to a point where uh, we started a, a full English uh, service that we're having now. And, uh, and so, but that's, that's my recommendation. You, you know, I'd like to add from my experience, if you just have one or two speaking another language, you can probably sit quietly and translate or maybe sit in a section and translate. Uh, or if you have several, the headphones are fine. But just like Brother Orozco said, it doesn't give the full message, the full experience. It doesn't address the larger cultural issue, the singing. So what happened in our church with Spanish, we would have sp Spanish-speaking people come. So we just had a few. We would use the headphones. But then, as it grew, they said, well, can we have a service? So we would do one Sunday night a month in the fellowship hall a service in Spanish so they get the full experience. But the rest of the time, they're listening to the English service on the headphone. Then we went to every other week. Then we went to every week. And then we said, okay, let's forget about the translation. Let's just have a full church. And so we started a Spanish-speaking church. And then later, it got its own building and moved off. Well, guess what happened? People still started coming to their original location because of family and friends, so we started all over with the headphones. And then we just went through the same thing, and we started a second Spanish church. So I think it has its place, especially with a very small number or with a start, 
but it doesn't meet the ultimate need. If the group grows, that's not going to be sufficient because it's basically an English church plus. And if you've got a significant group, they don't want to be just considered an offshoot or, or in reverse, Spanish and English could be the same way. That opens the door for an, another question for anyone on the panel to answer. Why is it that in some places people form separate congregations for each language group, while in others people promote having combined bilingual, trilingual services? Is one approach better than the other? Let me start. Uh, I don't think I need to be the only one. I think it depends on the circumstances. Uh, where I've seen it, bilingual service is when you have a true bilingual community, like near the border of Mexico, Laredo. It takes longer, so the whole church, has, if you're going to have a true bilingual service, it really takes a commitment from the whole church. And when you have a majority culture trying to reach a minority culture, it's one thing to have a vision to reach into that culture. It's another thing to change your whole church so that everybody participates. And so unless it's a bilingual community, it's really hard to sustain a truly bilingual church because it requires sacrifices on the part of everybody. Now, but there isn't often, like, say, reaching many ethnicities where you don't have a huge population or you don't have a constant stream of immigrants where many of the immigrants know English or their kids know English or they're married interculturally with English-speaking people, they really want a majority English church because that's where their family plugs in. So it might be a Korean woman who married an American. Well, her husband, her kids don't even speak Korean, so they don't want a Korean church. However, that woman would surely like to have a Bible study or a Sunday school class or a once-a-month fellowship. So there are some ethnicities you're never going to start a separate church but you're going to start a targeted outreach within your church because you have a family that wants both languages. And so, but now I will say in the long term, if you have a sizable population that needs a language, that is an indication it needs to be a church. And while it may be a daughter work or my, while it may be a multi-campus church, in the long run, if you're going to recruit a pastor to take over, I believe according to our own self-government, of the UPCI and uh, to provide proper incentives, that pastor needs to have the opportunity to eventually become a self-governing church and not forever be under a daughter work because just as our pastors wanted the opportunity to be able to lead and start their own church, we have to give that same privilege in the long term to other ministers that we raise up. You know, another just simple underlying principle is, you know, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word. It is really about making disciples and being able to communicate spiritual principles to people. So you may say, oh, I want a diverse congregation. But if you can't communicate effectively the principles of the word of God, then they need it in another language. And so... Uh, and communication is so much more than just language. So now if a person can go learn medical terms and learn engineering, they have English proficiency to that level, then they can probably understand the word of God. But you can't authentically disciple somebody that's not understanding what you're saying. And so at that point, there becomes a need to get some help or to divide it into a way that they can be discipled. Very good. What proactive steps can a pastor or a congregation of an essentially monolingual, monocultural church, what steps can they take to build a multicultural congregation? Anyone who would like to answer? Brother Mitchell, I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> I think they can be intentional in their evangelistic efforts. Okay. I think that would be the first step. Um, I think also um, educating their congregation as to their intent. I know for New Life Tabernacle, before we ever started to go down that road of diversifying the congregation, I first had to elevate their thinking that we need to diversify our church 
for all the right reasons because our community has changed. Then once the congregation connects to the vision, then it's easy for the pastor to now give the congregation the resources that are necessary to reach the community. Excellent, excellent. I want to ask a question, and Brother Leonard, maybe you can take the lead on it, and I would like to ask for all of us to feel comfortable. This question is, is sort of directed to those of us that are preachers and teachers in the movement, whether it be evangelists, pastors, uh, or whatever role. There are things that sometimes, because of various backgrounds and cultural upbringings, that there are phrases, idioms, slurs, that somehow seemingly innocent have worked its way into our vocabulary when we preach. And while in most cases the intent is not to be delivering a racial slur, it happens. I'll give you an example. I once had an evangelist preach for me, and he said something that I've heard many times from the pulpit, and I'm being sensitive here, but he said, when that revival kicked off, people started speaking in tongues like it was a Chinese laundry. Well, I've heard that for 30 years. It's not offensive to just about anybody in our church congregation except that one lady we have who was Chinese. Now, I didn't have a large Chinese uh, demographic in our church, and perhaps he didn't notice, or perhaps he didn't even think about it. But that's an example, so that's the context of the question. What are some things as ministry we should just avoid? Let, let's look at it like this. Here's some things that we should just cut out of our vocabulary in preaching. Go. Uh, I'll start off. Yes, this is important. Uh, I think, bottom line, any ethnic-based humor or any uh, comment that could put a certain ethnicity in a bad light is not appropriate from the pulpit and really probably not appropriate in your conversation. Now, I'm from Texas, uh, and I graduated from Rice University and University of Texas. Our rivals were at Texas A&M. So we tell Aggie jokes. But when I went to preach in College Station and the pastor said, he's a graduate from the University of Texas, there was a hiss from the whole congregation. <laughs> so even Aggie jokes, you have to be careful where you say them. But, but seriously, we've all probably heard or said what to us seemed inoffensive because we weren't meaning anything. But if you think of the person who maybe have suffered prejudice, it's not taken as an innocent joke. So I would just say any ethnic-based humor, even though you're trying to connect to the audience, is probably going to be a mistake because humor is one of those things that doesn't translate very well from one culture to another. So stay away from ethnic slang terms, ethnic humor, or even targeting ethnicity. You said it a while ago, but the, you've got to be authentic. You've got to be yourself. So if I'm preaching in a Spanish church, they love it if I can say, Gloria a Dios, or Dios le bendiga. But I don't have to try to preach the whole message in Spanish. If I'm going to a black church, I don't have to try to talk black. That would not be seen as authentic for me. That would be seen as fake. That would step back. I just, if I need to show that I love people. And even if I do make a mistake, if they know I love, that's going to give me an advantage. I'll give you an example. I had an evangelist came, come, or a teacher, and he was speaking to our leadership team. And of course, we were diverse. We had Hispanic, we had black for years. This is the way we were. We had interracial couples, Asian. So we get in this room, and he was from a culture where race was a big divide. And so he looked directly at a black couple who was one of our leadership team, and he said, I'm so glad to see you people here. Well, that was so offensive. He thought he was saying, I include all races. But what he was saying, we were a multiracial church. That's just who we were. So to single out one person and say, we're glad you're here, well, why don't you say to that white person, we're glad you're here. You know, it's inappropriate. They are the church. Who are you to welcome somebody that is more a member than you are? 
So although he was well-meaning by singling out one race, he lost not only that couple, he lost the whole group. Everybody turned him off because we felt like you're making us a racial church where we are beyond that. That's not the way we think. This is our brother in Christ. This is our sister in Christ. What do you mean we're glad you people are here? That doesn't even make sense. So, uh, so that's an example of how you can be well-intentioned but very hurtful. Um, and, and then I would also say, as I mentioned, slurs, but even like a term like redneck, to a white person might mean, okay, working class person, just a good old boy working class. But to a people of another race, that means a racist person. So if I said, I'm just a good old redneck, then the African American says, so you're a racist, huh? Yeah, you admit it, huh? So... You know, you do have to be careful uh, to stay away from that charge language. And I understand we don't want to be, quote, politically correct. You know, walking around eggshells trying to use uh, certain terms and avoid certain terms. But that's not the issue. The issue is what are you communicating? And you have to think of how the recipient sees it, not how you intend it. Because communication doesn't occur until the other person receives it. I'll give another example with the deaf community. Hearing people routinely will walk right in between the interpreter and the person receiving. Well, that's rude. That's like me interrupting you in the middle of speaking. The hearing person doesn't even know what they're doing. You just have to be more considerate. Walk around the interpreter sure. because you're interrupting a conversation or you're interrupting the preaching. So it's just a greater awareness, a greater sensitivity. And if you show real love to people and you still make a mistake, you can recover. But if they don't know you love them, mm. it's the end of the story. There you go. All right. I strongly believe that um, all of our ministries need to begin to train our ministers as to how we should conduct ourselves if we are privileged to be invited to another congregation. Uh, I think word usage is so important because today people wear their feelings on their shoulders and they're easily offended. So I think as uh, we move forward, we should begin to have sessions like these and even training sessions to our missionaries as to how you should conduct yourself and the words that you should try to avoid when you go from one congregation to the next. Very good. I would just say too, humility, you're going to make some mistakes yeah, in right. dealing with all of these cultures. Um, we started a church in inner city Detroit. Uh, I'm a white southerner, you know, pastor to all black church, but I had a good friend named Art Wilson and Dale Brooks. And so I was inquisitive, so you, you have to ask, develop strong relationships with people who can tell you what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. One, we rented our building out to another all African American group, and one day was in the foyer during the transition, and so the big usher back there, and I said, so, I said, now, are you Bishop Golden's boy? Well, to me, it's like, are you his son? You know, and so Sister Brooks was standing by. She said, "What now? What he means is, are you Bishop Golden's son?" I'm like, "What? What just happened?" She said, "Pastor Sister, don't say that." You know, and so, I, so I apologized. I said, "I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend you by that." And just realize you're going to you're going to say some things. Just apologize. Listen. Don't get offended that they're offended. Okay, that's our culture, right? Offended? Why are you offended? Well, they're offended because they're offended. That apologize, right? And have humility. That's, so good. that's it. <laughs> I didn't mean to cut you off. I would just okay. say that's so good. That's such yeah. good, clear, good. Clear and remember, we're trying to reach sinners, right. and we're trying to disciple people in our culture. So you're right. Don't get offended because right. somebody's offended. You're dealing with people you're trying to win to God, and even if they're saved, you're supposed to be the mature person trying right. to lead them. 
So it's set aside. Well, you have no right to be offended. I didn't mean that. That's beside the point. It's like if you're in China and you mm. use a slang word for Chinese, you don't get mad at them. I, I will say this, and I won't give the example because it's too bad, but uh, I was preaching in Australia and used a normal expression in American English that was probably the worst thing you could say. Oh, wow. And they kindly received it, but then came to me later and laughed and told me. And then what made me feel good, the leader said, well, I was in America, and he related he did the very same thing in reverse, spoke to a woman in what he thought was a normal Australian expression, and it turned out to be very inappropriate. So even in English, this happens. And there's no use to get offended. You just got to learn the rules. Right. Sinners don't behave like Christians. That's just too simple, isn't it? <laughs> Christians ought to behave like Christians, though, right? Amen. It's a sign of the end time. People are going to be offended. Let's not be shocked. People get offended. This clarity of that is so, so good. Uh, this question is, should diversity reflecting the demographics of the city or your region or your nation? Now, let's just make it clear. Should diversity reflecting the demographics of your community? Should it be at every level of the local district national church? If so, why doesn't this just happen naturally? It's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> I would say ideally yes, because think about it. in heaven, do we think everybody will be represented? I would say yes. Uh, do you think in heaven all the worship leaders will be a certain race? I don't think so. Uh, so that's ideally. But I will qualify it by saying um, when you're dealing with a minority culture or language, there is a deliberate intention strategy of having a minority-based church. So to have a Hispanic congregation or a black congregation predominantly, that makes sense because you're trying to reach a minority that otherwise is going to be neglected. Although I would say, as several have already pointed out, even those ethnic-based churches should, should seek to be intentionally diverse. But what I'm saying is it's not as significant for them because they're already uh, providing a space for people who are otherwise underrepresented. I do think, here was my thinking in Austin. Although one church cannot reach all of Austin, I want to plant other churches. I want to raise up black and Hispanic pastors because they'll be and Asian because they'll be more effective than I am in reaching certain people. However, I want everyone who lives in our, our metro area to feel like they could come to our church, they could belong, and they could be in leadership. I wanted that atmosphere. I told the pastors that I train, I said, now look, just because you're black, if a black person comes to my church, I'm not going to send them to you. And if a white person comes to your church, don't send them to me. Now, if we are not successful in reaching that person, then we can share resources and maybe hand them off or, you know, because we'll work as a team. But I think so. I'm, for, a, for an ethnic minority church, I'm saying they should have a vision to be diverse, but there's nothing wrong with them focusing on their targeted group that's historically underrepresented. For a majority white church, they need to be more intentionally multicultural. And yes, I think the goal should be diverse. But I will say, it's not a matter of quotas. If you have a network of churches that you're sponsoring or in fellowship with or you've raised up, and together they're reaching the diversity of the city, you are accomplishing the same purpose as long as you're not intentionally segregated. So even if your church is 90% white and you're helping other churches be raised up, that are effective, or you're in partnership with other churches that are reaching minorities, then you're not a failure. I do think, so I don't think every church has to be proportional. I do think the network of churches that you fellowship with and that you commit to and that you partner with should be. And so the UPCI of a section and a district should. Uh, but each local church may have a focus. Having said that, even the local church that might be majority white should be intentionally open to everyone because there are going to be certain people that that's who are going to be the best way to reach them. So on a, certainly on a section, district, and general level, I do think our goal 
would be to represent our society, even though certain local churches may have over or under representation just normally. But how does that happen? You've already said intentional mentoring. And ultimately, under our system, people are appointed or elected. Leadership should expand their pool of qualified candidates to make sure they use the power of appointment to various offices and committees to reflect diversity. On the electoral level, obviously, we try to vote for who, whom we think is best qualified. So that's not always going to be a racial category. Again, I would just say let's create paths where people can become qualified, can get the ap appropriate exposure and experience, which may come through appointed offices first. So at least the electorate knows who's available and qualified. And then eventually that will automatically, naturally be reflected. But it does take time, it does take education, it does take mentorship, and it does take intentionality. So I would say each local church, you're trying to fulfill the mission, not necessarily meet a quota. Right. But from a general level, we do want to see leadership gradually evolve to be very reflective, not only of our society, but of our own internal constituency, which is diverse. Very good, very good. We're in the last 25 minutes of, of our forum, so at this point, if there are questions from our live audience, I'm asking Brother Wilson to help us out in the audience. We have a microphone set up there. If you have a question, if you, if you want to ask, uh, please just go to the microphone. Brother Wilson will assist you, and we'll hear questions direct to the panel from you. And I'm going to begin going through some Facebook Live uh, questions that we have as well. One of them is sort of directed to me, and I'll ask anyone else to comment, but the question is how does creating specific multicultural ministries help to reach certain people groups, and, and what's the purpose, or why are we creating these ministries? So I would say first, uh, the idea is not to imply that you can't do it without us. We have a Filipino evangelism ministry. That doesn't imply that you can't have a Filipino ministry in your church if you don't have us. What we're doing by creating a ministry is we're trying to bring an organized focal point and that ministry will begin to create activities and resources that will help channel the energy to reach that particular culture all over North America. Through their conferences, it's a time to come together. It's a time to identify Filipino leaders, Filipino constituents is a time to identify uh, a potential uh, uh, Filipino uh, ministries that could be highlighted. It's a time to find out where we are and who we are and come together. Many of our cultures really enjoy the time of fellowship that they can have by coming together and celebrating. It's a time as for us as leadership to figure out where we are in the fellowship so that we can come together and organize. And then that begins to blossom as those conferences that we develop begin to grow. Then from that, we bring leadership together. We identify who can help us focus and develop resources, develop uh, strategies that will help us to focus on that culture. The idea of having a ministry set up is not to begin to create these subgroups that are going to be silos and split off or be independent. The idea is simply to help bolster our evangelism, whether it be Chinese, Filipino, Korean, Native American, so on and so forth. The idea is not to create a separate uh, segmented uh, or segregated group. The idea is to help all the North American church evangelize that culture and in those conferences, in each conference, we're trying to have a segment of each of those conferences where it's designed not for the people that the conference is focused on, but it's designed for North American pastors to come and learn, how do I reach this culture? Because it's not my background, not my ethnicity, not my language. Show me how to reach this culture. You know, that's a great, great answer. So let me talk to a pastor as having been a pastor. So multicultural ministries will provide training tools in, in the language. So globaltracks.com, you've got language. So you, you, if you're trying to reach different ethnicity, multicultural ministries may have some language resources for you. 
training of ministers who can plant churches, fellowship, network. So, for instance, you might have two or three Filipinos in your church. They love you as pastor. They speak English. They're fine. But they might love to go to an annual conference where they know other, they see for the first time that there are UPC people all across North America just like them. That helps them to be more committed to your local church, knowing they're part of an, a national and even international network. So that strengthens the pastor. Another example, I told you I had a large Hispanic. One-fourth of our church is Hispanic. Well, the main church, they wanted English. That's why they're coming to the main church instead of one of our daughter works. However, many were bilingual and many were still connected to their culture. So if I would announce a Spanish ladies conference or men's conference, they would love to go to that because they could still be part of my church and get English, but they could be connected to their heritage and feel like they're helping their brothers and sisters who don't speak English. And so it was a win-win. They didn't have to choose between church and heritage. They could have both. And then, of course, if we had a missionary to a Spanish-speaking country, they naturally had an affinity. Another thing, it can bless your whole church. So I, at different times, I had deaf preacher come to preach for our whole congregation. And, or other ethnicity. And that's a different experience where the main preaching is in sign language, and it's interpreted for the rest of the congregation. What that does to the deaf people in your church makes them feel like we're front and center. We're important. This service is for us, and all the other people get to, to listen in. But what it does to the main church is give them an appreciation for the different cultures in their own church and a burden. And some of the greatest services we had were to have someone of another language minister. So it's not only how you can reach the ethnicity, being involved in this can bless your church. Very good. I want to give you an example that I just experienced last week in the deaf, in, in the deaf conference, which is this principle can spread over to all of our cultural groups. I spent about three hours in leadership with a large group, about 60 or 70 uh, deaf leaders. And uh, we're, we're so thrilled to have our deaf team and interpreters here with us today. Can you give them a round of applause? Amen. But here was, the, here was the question that came to me. And when it came into me, it, it literally broke my heart. I, I was very emotional. Because a, a deaf gentleman, he said, I love my pastor. And I love our church. But we have a very, very small group of deaf people in our church. He said, there's only two or three of us on occasion. He said, I know that I, if I would take the amount of fellowship time that I feel like I need, I use too much of my pastor's time. He has a family. He has others to minister to. But it's very taxing because with interpreting, it takes more time. And he said, deaf people, we get lonely. He said, we have a, he said, we have a large feeling of loneliness on us all the time because of our hearing disability, we are cut off. And because interpreting requires so much more time and specific people, it drains energy from people. And he said, I want to fellowship with deaf people from other churches through deaf ministries. He said, but I don't want my pastor to feel like I'm planning on leaving our church. And so his response was, I love my pastor. I'm not going anywhere. But I don't want to hurt my pastor by fellowshipping outside the church. And so his question to me was, how can we help our United Pentecostal Church pastors understand that we have a need at times to fellowship within our group. And that varies slightly between different cultures, but let's just be honest. Let's just be clear. Sometimes we just like being around folks like us who understand our history, who understand our culture, and that doesn't make us racist. It doesn't make us pro. It's just, it's just comfortable. And these meetings 
uh, sometimes are just like reunions. It doesn't mean that we're planning on starting another organization. Absolutely not. It doesn't mean we're splitting away or even implying the thought for it. The idea is let's come together to get revitalized, get ignited, and bring us back to the focus of evangelizing our cultural group. Amen. Amen. Brother Chavis, I just wanted to tag on to that. You know, we're preaching to the choir here today. You believe in multicultural evangelism or you wouldn't be here. So the audience, we really want to affect the people who don't know why multicultural ministry, right? And so I think the key is empathy. And for a white American that's living in a majority culture, many of us never experience that, right? Now, I experienced it in South Africa being a minority. Brother Bernard mentioned last night he, he had uh, experienced that in Korea. I also experienced it in Detroit. And then uh, as a teenager uh, living in Mississippi, I had a unique experience I shared in my session where God showed me what that looked like and what that felt like. It, you'll never understand, and I'm speaking to Caucasian ministers that maybe don't understand, you have to put yourself in their shoes and have empathy for what it means to be a minority uh, in a culture. And uh, God has to show you that. That's a beautiful example of talking to somebody. You don't know that until you have that interaction and somebody explains that to you. You can't dismiss that because you think maybe as Brother Bernard mentioned today, politically, somebody's trying to run an agenda. No, this is real people that have real feelings of isolation. Uh, Jamil McLaurin, a church planner in Detroit area, uh, we were at a mentoring thing. He raised his hand. They asked us to tell something that nobody would know about each of us. And so one of the things, and we were supposed to guess who it was, he said, I've been stopped by the police 22 times and have never received a violation. I don't know what it's like to have been stopped by a policeman 22 times just for them to ask me some questions and check me out. I'll never have that experience because I was born white. But if I could put myself in Jamil McLaurin's place and feel what he feels when he is repeatedly as a upstanding citizen and I can't dismiss that experience. Anyway, empathy. It's, it's been said, it's being said, you'll hear it again in the future. When, it, when we speak about African Americans in the United States and Native Americans in the United States, many people say they just need to get over it. It's in the past, leave it in the past. Brother Sistrick's point about having empathy, you never really know how that feels until you're in that position. Native American, First Nation people, and African Americans, they have a unique history in this country. And that's why, as a fellowship, we have a unique focus toward that, because it's a real need. I'll give you another test. One of our pastors personally told me, he's got a very nice church, and he was parked outside in his parking lot of church finishing up some stuff before he was leaving. A policeman came by and stopped him or interrogated him. What are you doing in this neighborhood? What are you doing in the parking lot of this church? He said, I'm the pastor. The man said, show me your ID. He didn't happen to have that. And he said, they took him out and handcuffed him, put him in the back of the police car because they were having trouble in the neighborhood. And he sat there for about an hour until he, they could get called in and verify his identity. And he told me, I was so humiliated. I'm the pastor of the church. I'm being questioned while I'm in this neighborhood sitting in this nice car in this parking lot of this nice church. And now I'm put in handcuffs in the back of the police car and I'm worried what are the neighbors going to think or what people who have visited our church, they drive by and they see me in the back of this police car. What are they going to think? 
And of course, he was ultimately, his identity was verified. He was released, so no harm, no foul, you know, no police brutality. So from, from the police point of view, it wasn't necessarily wrong in the sense of they didn't do anything illegal, but just the idea of being in that situation. As a United Pentecostal pastor, how would you like to be in the parking lot of your right. church in the back of a police car for an hour or two? Right. And so that does change when you talk about, well, police killings and brutality and these guys shouldn't have been where there and shouldn't have done that. And maybe all that's true, but there's a real perception that you shouldn't just dismiss and say it's no problem. And as a church, we have to be respectful of everybody's feelings, not just our own. I want to make a suggestion. If you're a white pastor, black pastor, Hispanic, Latino, Native American, whatever it is, I want to make a suggestion. Have a meeting several times a year in this current season we're in with all of your young people and all of your young adults and have a very clear conversation about how you should act, how you should behave when you get stopped by the police. We appreciate our law enforcement. Amen. Amen. Many of our constituents are law enforcement officers. Yeah. It would be uh, disingenuous to assume that nobody on the police force ever did anything wrong or made a mistake. That's not the point. The point is, at large, they have a job to do. However, I think we need to educate our young people and our young adults that understand these people, whether they are good or bad or whatever, they're facing things and they're in situations all day long that have them at a heightened sense of danger and awareness. And they may take action based on things you do that you are not trying to, uh, you may not be thinking about. Maybe you're talking back to them or maybe you're having a bad attitude or maybe you're resisting in some way. I think as pastors and leaders, we should bring some education and discuss the issues and help our younger generation understand we're in a critical point in our, our society here in North America. Bad things can happen and escalate very quickly. That's not to say that we're justifying anything that was done wrong. Amen? But what we are saying, if there's going to be a problem, let that problem not come from us or let us not exacerbate an issue by uh, uh, in, in some way provoking someone who's already at a heightened sense of awareness or urgency. Amen. Here's a question that's come from the audience, and it says, is there advice, and I'll ask Brother Mitchell and Brother Orozco to help us with this, is there advice to minority pastors who want to reach white cultures, Caucasian families and cultures, is there advice for minority pastors that will help them to evangelize the Caucasian uh, folks without being offensive. Tough question. Difficult question. But I think from what I've heard from this panel is no matter what the culture group is, just show love to people. I think if you can respect people for who they are, regardless of color or race, and just reach for them, I think people gravitate to love more than anything else. If you can just respect people and love people, people will accept the message that you're giving them, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Brother Roscoe. Amen. I second that. I, I believe that, uh, you know, this saying that before you can win somebody for God, you have to win them to yourself. It's very and good. And that is a very important thing. Once you become friends with them, you start relating with them, then, then you can talk about anything, and including the gospel, and they will not get offended. They, because they know that you love them. They know that they, they already, you have showed them that you love them. And once you pass that, no problem. Amen. Sure. Brother Art Wilson helped me with this. Not in, I don't know that he ever articulated this, but let's just forget about all the past, right? And so that's how you have to have a relationship with people. It's there. The history's there. But on a one-on-one, 
in South Africa, I got charged with all of the, when people saw me down the street, I got charged with all the crimes of apartheid. I felt it. Somebody looked at me, they just dumped all that history on top of me, right? As a, uh, in Detroit, I had people walk into the church, they see a white pastor, they walk out. Why? Because they charged me with all of that, okay? So don't charge any. I know that's, that's idealistic in the world, but Brother Art Wilson and I, we never talked as, oh, well, you're black, I'm white. So, no, we're just brothers trying to build churches in Detroit. You know, we just, it was never an issue because he didn't charge me with anything, and I didn't pray stereotypes on him. We just related. And so that's only possible in the church. But it is possible in the church, and that's the great thing about it. It is possible, and that's what's going to attract people to us, and we're going to have a great revival. Amen. What I'd like to do, well, we have a question. Brother Jetty? It, oh, there's additional questions. Okay. Let's, we're going to be able to take about two or three, and then we'll, we'll be at the end. Okay, Dalton's going to come from Urshan Graduate School. Hello, uh, you know, I'm an Urshan student, and I wanted to know if there's anything, any advice that you have for our apostolic colleges as a whole, and more specifically our students to get involved and to help promote multicultural ministries. I do believe our colleges, some of them at least, are offering multicultural studies or mission studies, and I think that will be an important part of every curriculum in the future. And if uh, I also believe that Students should not wait till they get out of school, but they should find opportunities for ministry while in school. And I do think one of the most fruitful areas, I've seen this happen at Urshan College in St. Louis. Also, my, my son Daniel, who's a full-time student pastor in Houston, reaching into the schools, especially the uh, impoverished schools or the schools in lower income areas or have lots of issues. Often they're heavily minority, and they welcome mentors, coaches, you know, life coaches. And there's even though it's public school, there's an amazing opportunity for college kids to come alongside and be friends or mentors in some of the school system. So be creative and, and find ways to get involved in the community. And, of course, it's ideal if the school can help facilitate that. I do know that Urshan has a, a class, it's an, I think it's an elective class, it's, uh, it's on diversity. And uh, I spoke there about a year ago with Sister Danisha Gates. And uh, I would encourage all of our colleges to consider having diversity tracks and, and maybe perhaps this panel could become a resource um, to the colleges in developing a curriculum. I know that any of us here would be willing to go and speak and spend some time with the young people at our colleges to invest. Next question. Uh, Troy from Arlington's coming. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I've enjoyed the session this morning. Uh, my question is, uh, it's probably more geared towards uh, building the bridge, uh, Pastor Mitchell, and I guess anyone can chime in. But uh, how does building the bridge, or I guess the UPCI, uh, what's the strategy for evangelizing uh, the Hebrew Israelite community? Uh, you have more and more black people leaving the church, and especially millennials leaving the church, and they are identifying with uh, the doctrines there because they're identifying with a certain culture, a long lost culture, uh, that they can't find in church. So my question is, how would we engage that community? Uh, because it's just growing and growing and growing. It's not going to dwindle down anytime soon. I'm going to be very transparent with you. I've just recently heard about that group, and it was brought to my attention by our young adults ministry director. And when it came to me, I said, I'm going to do some research as to that group and what it is that is attracting African American towards them, because that ministry is not as known to me as it might be to someone else out there. So I couldn't speak to that question today, 
but I promise you I'll have an answer for you if you give me some time. But maybe someone on the panel might know a little bit more about that group and could answer that question. All I would suggest is if you would like to connect with Brother David Sagal, who is in this meeting, he is a wealth of information uh, regarding Jewish evangelism. Uh, he is he, uh, Jewish himself, and perhaps he can speak to that in this meeting while you're here today. Amen. We have another question from the audience, and we're getting close to our wrap-up time. Brother Jetty. Hi, good morning. First, I'd like to say that this forum is an excellent idea, and I think we need to do a lot more of these uh, in the future. Um, this is one resource that people will be able to dip back into, and uh, hopefully we can put some metadata behind it and make it searchable. My question really has to do with resources, and it goes back to the, probably the first question that was asked. It's wonderful that we have college-based resources that are now being developed but what are we generating to put the resources together to talk about relational evangelism tools, the tools that we need for cross-cultural communication, how to better understand how to communicate across cultures? It's wonderful that we have events that are focused on cultures specifically, but unless we do a really good job of getting people from other cultures to come to that specific conference, um, the challenge is putting the tools in the hands of leaders, to multicultural coordinators, and to those folks that want to reach across culture but don't know how. And I know that global tracks are out there, but that's once you've built relationship and you want to move into a direction of ministering to them, those tools are there, but what about before that point? Very good, I have two points for you. The first point is in the lobby on our MCM table, we have a book that was put together by our former MCM director, Brother Don Hanscom and Brother Bernard. It talks about the church in a multicultural world. There's some essays that deal with this specific question. But in addition to that, there are 14 different cultural groups that our ministry directors put together, sort of a list of do's and don'ts, uh, bullet points that are just really, really specific. As an example, our Korean director, wrote something there that shocked me. I would have never known it. I'm from the South. Uh, when I meet you, I, I will probably do a combination of shaking your hand, punching you on the arm, or hugging you. We're, we're just touchers where I'm from. But in this booklet, Brother Su outlines that Korean people don't like to be patted on the back and touched in that way. I would have never known that, and that helped me. So that is an excellent resource. The next resource I will mention is our ministry conferences. We try to have segments within our training and our labs at those conferences that help pastors understand and answer those very questions. And I will say we want to get better at that in the future. And a very, very good question. We, our time is just right there. Uh, I wanted to go around and, and let everyone uh, here on the panel leave one major point. But we only have three minutes and Bishop Bernard has to catch a flight. Uh, I will like to give him the last word, and then we'll, we'll dismiss. Well, I'm thankful for what God is doing. This is tremendous progress, but much more needs to be done. And I believe we should pray. And I'm hoping the people here, you have a, an interest in multicultural evangelism. And maybe we can't pray equally for everything, but I wish every one of us would take one or two cultures and make them a matter of focused prayer. In Spanish evangelism, we're seeing tremendous growth, but we need to see a Filipino ministry, tremendous growth. Native American, we're seeing growth. French. French, we're seeing growth. I think building the bridge has some intentional strategies that's gonna increase the profile of African Americans and planting of churches by African American pastors. But if each of us would take one or two cultures and ask God to lay them on our heart, we need a revival. What we're doing is just scratching the surface. And when I read the list, I'm so thankful. But then when I see, well, this group may only have five churches. Well, this group may have only 25 churches. The need is so much greater. We must have a quick harvest. We need some intercessory prayer. At Multicultural Ministries, 
one of our primary of our three main focuses right now is developing new resources for the UPCI Fellowship and the apostolic world to use. And what I'm hearing in my interactions with all three of these gentlemen is that their ministries are doing the very same thing. So we look forward to releasing new tools to help our fellowship. Would you stand and give our panel a big round of applause? Uh, we appreciate each of them taking time to be here and be a part of this. Amen. And uh, before we close down our live stream, I wonder if we just lift our hands throughout this congregation. Let's pray for the United Pentecostal Church that we advance in reaching every culture. Lord, we love you, Jesus, and we're so humbled to be a part of this end-time revival that you want to bring to the church, a multicultural revival. Give us wisdom, Lord. Your word said, if a man lack wisdom, let him ask to the one who giveth liberally and upbraideth not, but let him ask in faith. Lord, in faith today, we're asking for wisdom. Help us to reach every culture. Help us to reach every nation. Help us to bless the ethnic cultures and minorities within our borders, God, and evangelize them. Make them a part of us. Lord, help us to reach all cultures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We've got a 30-minute break. I want to encourage you to step out into the hallway and meet our multicultural ministries uh, directors and uh, see their displays, pick up their cards and contact information. I want to encourage you to visit the Pentecostal Publishing House booth. They are selling here before and after our last session. And at 12 o'clock, we're going to be starting with our Holy Ghost Crusade. You don't want to miss this. Be back in the main sanctuary. All our groups will collapse in here. We're going to have a powerful time of worship and preaching. No announcements, no offerings. It's just going to be worship in the Word, and God is going to move. God bless you. Thank you for being a part of this today.